Hi there, my name is Mike Sullivan. I'm the Program Director of Ballard Medical Services. I'd like to welcome you to this presentation from our series of continuing education for pre-hospital providers. Now, before we begin, there's a few things we need to go over. First off, the information presented in this program is intended for use by trained EMS providers. Also, due to variations in protocols and scope of practice among different states, departments, and agencies, this program may discuss or depict procedures, medications that are not acceptable in your daily use. If you see something in this presentation that varies from your agency's policy, always follow your department's protocols. Also, none of our authors or presenters of this program have any conflicts of interest or financial relationships they need to disclose. We do have documentation of this on file available in our office upon request. While we do our best to make sure that all the content we present is the most current available, participants are reminded that medicine is indeed a dynamic science and thus changes rapidly. So things may have changed since we've written or compiled this program. Please always follow the most up-to-date information available. In closing, if you have any questions about this or any of our other programs, please email us at info at ValorMed.net. Thank you very much and welcome to the program. Alrighty, now that we've got all that legal stuff out of the way, before we get started, let's talk about coffee for a second. If you're looking for a great cup of coffee, you probably want to check out CoffeeBrandCoffee.com. They're an online retailer, American owned and operated. They have a wide variety of coffees, teas, hot cocos, all sorts of different flavors. They've got all sorts of organic teas. You can get coffee in bean form, ground form, K cups, whatever the your heart desires. I've had several of the different blends and several of the different flavors. Absolutely fantastic. And because they are an American-owned small business, they don't have a big warehouse, so they don't have a big supermarket sales business. They roast it, they bag it, they ship it to you. It'll pretty much be some of the freshest stuff you'll ever get. Definitely highly recommend them. And they've got a promo code out for us now. If you use promo code Valor SDS, you get a 5% discount off any order. So you can save a little money, try some fresh coffee, see what you like. They've always got different flavors coming through on their website. Some are permanent, some are limited time only. And if you look right there in the picture, you can see they've even got, yes, double caffeinated. Definitely a winner around this office. Alrighty, now let's get to class. Hi there, my name is Mike Sullivan and I'm one of the instructors here at Ballard Medical Services. In today's presentation, we'll be discussing hemorrhage control. Now, in the National Registry Objectives, they came up with several things related to bleeding control. First off, we're going to talk about ways to identify severe hemorrhage. We'll discuss some of the traditional hemorrhage control methods, many of which have been around for years, and then we'll get on to and differentiate among indications, contraindications, and methods of use for the following. Tourniquets, junctional tourniquets, hemostatic agents, and even TXA or transemic acid. Now when we talk about bleeding control, let's think back for a second about blood. Every cell in the body relies on blood to supply it with oxygen or nutrients and carry away waste products. Blood is literally the liquid gift of life that we have. Therefore, bleeding has to be controlled. While some pre-hospital environment ALS providers can replace blood with saline, being able to replace blood with actual blood is very rare. Now, I'm not going to say there's not some systems doing it. I know that some have gotten there, as well as in air medical transport and some critical care settings. But as a general rule of thumb, most of the time, patient won't get blood replacement until they get to the hospital. Therefore, it's imperative that we do our best to keep as much of their blood inside their body as we can. Now, we know the average adult male has about five to six liters of blood in their body, while the average adult female is between four and five. So if we take the average of those, about five, then we look at signs of compensated shock appearing with as little as 15 to 20 percent of blood loss. 20 percent is one-fifth. So putting all that together, if a patient loses one liter of blood, there's a pretty good chance you'll be seeing signs of compensated shock right from the get-go. And a patient with a significant wound or significant injury can lose this much blood by the time we can get on scene. 
Now, when we look at arterial bleeding, this is going to be spurting hemorrhage. It sprays. It's under pressure whenever the heart pumps. It's coming from an artery, of course, which is a pressurized vessel, and therefore, it can spray long distances and be very difficult to control and very difficult to get a clot to form. Venous bleeding can be just as significant as arterial bleeding, however, instead of spurting, it's going to be flowing rather rapidly. If we think of arterial bleeding as being under pressure, venous bleeding is a continuous flow like a stream or a river. Either one can move a great deal of liquid very quickly. Now, capillary bleeding is actually slowly oozing blood, typically from superficial wounds, abrasions, things like that. For the most part, capillary bleeding won't be as bad or as significant as bleeding from either an artery or a vein. However, if a patient has large-scale abrasions, such as from an accident on pavement or road rash, things like that, they can still lose a significant amount of blood. Now, when we look at types of hemorrhage, hemorrhage itself is external bleeding. Most of the time, it can be controlled with very simple means typically direct pressure, pressure bandages, things like that, and the bleeding will be manageable or controlled. In some cases, we'll get to what we call severe hemorrhage. This is external bleeding that's not being controlled by simple means, and therefore requires more aggressive modalities. These more aggressive modalities can include tourniquets, hemostatics, or TXA, many of which are somewhat newer in the field. Now, I'm not embarrassed to say that I went through EMT school back in the early 90s. And back when I went through school in the land of the dinosaurs, our bleeding control was pretty much limited to direct pressure, elevation, maybe pressure points, and as an absolute last resort, maybe we could use a tourniquet. But in those days, we were cautioned very, very strongly that by using a tourniquet, you were almost guaranteeing that the patient, if they didn't lose the limb involved, they'd at least have a significant loss of use of that limb. In fact, there's a picture there of me when I was back in EMT school. Yeah, it's been a few years. But things have changed, and we've gotten a lot smarter, and we'll talk about some of the reasons why. But now we've moved from the land of the dinosaurs to present day, we have direct pressure. Of course, we'll use pressure bandage, but now we can get into tourniquets and hemostatic agents and possibly TXA. Tourniquets are no longer seen as such a bad thing. As a matter of fact, tourniquets have become a far more acceptable intervention. It says here, for years, it was assumed and taught and passed down from EMT to EMT and paramedic to paramedic that the use of a tourniquet would almost always lead to loss of a limb or loss of limb function. This is no longer true, and there's a lot of reasons behind it. One big reason is better tourniquet design and construction. This better design and construction does not do as much damage at the site of application as some of the older tourniquets did. Another major advance is better care at receiving facilities. These patients have a much higher standard of care that they receive at receiving facilities now than they did back in the late 80s or early 90s. There have been major advances in both neurological and vascular care, allowing surgeons and neurosurgeons to do much more to restore function of a limb that's damaged. Lastly, better access to specialty facilities. Many of the studies that were conducted regarding tourniquets were largely based in the military setting, and these were military settings that were conducted during the Korea and Vietnam era. Nowadays, in most parts of this country, we can have a patient to a trauma center level one or two, typically in an hour or less. As compared to what we were dealing with overseas way back when, this is a major change. In those days, we would have patients with a tourniquet on for five, six, seven hours going to a field hospital. Now we have a patient with a tourniquet on that's in front of a neurosurgeon in a level one trauma center in under an hour. Therefore, these changes have led to the change in the outcome. Tourniquets are no longer a loss of limb guarantee and they're no longer a loss of limb functionality. However, the need to keep blood inside the patient's body has not changed. Therefore, we need to become more adept with our tools and better using the tools based on the newer science. 
Now, when we talk about types of tourniquets, the old school we learned about improvised tourniquets. You could use a triangle bandage or another piece, piece of cloth, use a stick or something as a windlass, torque it down, and basically cut off enough of the circulation to stop the bleeding. In austere medicine, sometimes they talk about using either a belt or a webbing strap or a backpack strap. Again, something they can do to clamp down, cut off circulation, and thus decrease bleeding. I've seen some people in the pre-hospital environment use a blood pressure cuff where they'll pump the blood pressure cuff up to 200, clamp it down, and that way, again, squeeze off the blood flow, stopping the bleeding. All of these will work, however, we need to remember that improvised tourniquets of any style such as this have one major limitation. The improvisation and the setting up to do it may take a lot of time, and the patients don't have that. A patient who's having major exsanguinating hemorrhage needs to have that bleeding stop as quickly as possible. And sometimes digging out a cravat or a triangle bandage, tying a knot, and then trying to find a stick or something to use as a windlass and trying to get it secure enough, you're taking time, and you're taking time the patients really don't have. Along with this, we have the advent of many commercial tourniquets. These have proven to be very, very useful in the field. I've got some pictures of some of them. Some of the most common ones I've seen out there are the CAT or the Combat Application Tourniquet, the Soft T Tourniquet, the TX2 or TX3, two different brands out right now, or two different models, I should say, the Parabelt, which is actually something some of our wilderness people use, because they're out in an austere environment, their belt can actually double as a tourniquet. And there's a whole bunch of other models out there now. I would strongly suggest whichever one you have in your equipment or in your cache, you become familiar with it. Practice with it before you need it. Because quite frankly, even though many of these commercial tourniquets, and I think all of them actually come packaged or prepackaged with instructions, when a patient's bleeding out in front of you, is not the time to pull out the instructions and try to read them. You should be intimately familiar with these and able to deploy them rapidly, typically 30 seconds or less. Now we'll look at some of the common ones here. On the left, the one in black there, that's North American Rescue. It's a CAT or a combat application tourniquet. Um, it has the windlass there. You can see it's the plastic-looking stick. And once you apply it to the patient with the Velcro, you torque it down, and then the windlass slips into that little plastic clip there, and you Velcro over it. Now, the soft tee that's on the right is a little bit different. It still has the independent windlass. It's that metal thing with the two clips looking on the end. And as you torque it down, once you get it to the point that the bleeding has stopped, you use those triangle-shaped clips to clip over the end of it, and that holds the windlass in place. Now, Red Medics has come out with some interesting ones. The one on the left there is their Parabelt. Again, it's a dual-purpose item. It's fairly popular in some of the wilderness stuff, also uh, hunting, things like that, who are trying to carry minimal weight on long trips. The only thought I have with that is, if we use it for bleeding control or something else, who's going to hold up our pants? Hmm. Now, on the right, we've got the Red Medics uh, TX3. It's actually designed to be a very wide, it's a three inch wide tourniquet. It's somewhat wider than the other two. Personally, I've you know worked with a couple of them. I have not had a chance to play with the Parabelt yet, but all of them work fairly well. They're all based on the same general principles and they're all designed what? For rapid deployment, rapid application to deal with severe hemorrhage before a patient gets too far exsanguinated. Now, there's also junctional tourniquets. Now, junctional tourniquets are a little bit different. They're designed for wounds that are junctional in nature or in junctional areas of the body, where a limb joins the torso or connects to the torso. Now, these have been tested and used with pretty good success by the Committee on Tactical Combat Casualty Care, and they've approved a number of these devices for use in military settings. They've been field tested, not really real adapted over much to the civilian setting or the pre-hospital setting and stateside yet. However, so far they're working well overseas. It remains to be seen what we have go on over here. 
Many of the reasons that we're seeing these used a lot overseas is there are the junctions, especially if you look where the chest meets the shoulder, things like that, where there may be gaps in body armor and so therefore an exposure for a wounding. There's the SAM junctional, the combat ready clamp, and the junctional emergency treatment tool. Any of these, if you're interested in them, I'm sure you can find more online. I really don't have any hands-on experience with these that I can share with you. Now, hemostatic agents and dressings. This term is a very generic term and it refers to any topical agent that's applied to a wound or an injury where a tourniquet's not able to be used. There's all sorts of different brands and models on the market. Um, now, sometimes you'll find they have just the powder, just the hemostatic agent itself. Other times it's impregnated into a gauze pad, as you can see here. Regardless, these are great for chest or abdominal wounds, things where a tourniquet's just not going to work. However, we still need to do something to deal with severe bleeding. Now, some of the most common agents out there, we have Kytosan. Now, Kytosan was marketed out under the name of Hemcon or Kytoflex. It was developed in about 2005, and the active agent in it is derived from shrimp shells or shrimp hulls. It's fairly effective at bleeding control, had a good shelf life, about four to five years, and was available in various configurations as far as gauze, wraps, bandages, that type of thing. However, there was a great deal of concern over the theoretical allergic reactions. People were wondering if we use this wonderful bleeding control agent on someone who's allergic to seafood or is allergic to shrimp, could we cause a reaction? Well, they did a study through military medicine in 2011, and it came out that this was not a major issue. I've read up on the study, and I've cited it down at the base of this slide. But what they did was they got 10 subjects together, all who had certified documented allergies to shrimp shells and shrimp hulls. They actually tested them to make sure that they reacted to shrimp shells or shrimp hulls. All of these 10 patients had active aggressive reactions to the control substance. These individuals were then exposed to the active ingredient in these kytosan dressings and did not react, showed little reaction, if any, to the product. Therefore, while some people will say that this, you know, what if it's someone's allergic to shrimp? Again, this study has pretty much proven, for the most part, that that's not a major concern. Now, granted, I know that 10 is a very low test number. However, 10 out of 10 was a fairly significant result. The information on that study is down at the bottom of the slide if you want to read up on it a little bit more. Another agent came out as around 2012. Quick clot devices came out with devices impregnated with kaolin. This is an inorganic mineral accelerating the body's natural clotting ability and it doesn't produce a reaction or an exothermic reaction. It doesn't give off any specific heat. It's not done as a almost a chemical cautery. It's actually fairly gentle use for the patient. It consists of non-woven gauze can be applied to either the region of trauma to promote clotting or can be used for wound packing measures as well. These are fairly common on the market these days, so if you do happen to go out and you see something, this is most likely what your active agent will be on most things on the market these days. Now, onwards and upwards, we'll talk about TXA or transemic acid. This is a medication that's administered via IV bolus with a follow-up drip and it's designed to interfere with the process of breaking down a blood clot, thus to help maintain and stabilize any newly formed clots. Previously, it's been used in other areas of medicine to help with bleeding. It's actually been used with fairly good success in both uh, hemophiliacs, uh, patients with dental surgery, patients with bleeding disorders, and it's actually been studied in some cases for the pre-hospital environment. Now, in this research for the pre-hospital environment, they came out and did a randomized clinical trial which showed a reduced risk of death by bleeding if TXA is given within three hours of initial injury. This roughly 30% reduction in risk of death was very, very good. They showed even better results if it was given within one hour of the incident. 
However, both of these still said you've got an hour to give it, and so therefore it hasn't necessarily pushed very hard to the pre-hospital environment, as opposed to something that has to be used within 10-15 minutes of the incident. Now, in the same study, it was found that there was an increase in risk of death from bleeding if TXA was administered more than three hours after the injury. So again, when you look at these, again, the CRASH-2 studies was a significant study and it basically proved that yes, TXA is useful. However, timeline-wise, it doesn't necessarily need to be done in the pre-hospital environment. Many trauma centers have it as one of their early uh, modalities when they get there. Now, TXA, if you are using it or you're looking into it, the dosing regimen they use in most hospital settings, they'll give one gram IV over a 10-minute window, and then they'll follow it with one gram IV over an eight-hour window. The nice part is minimal side effects related to it, and the cost is fairly inexpensive. You see it's 10 to $20 per gram in the U.S., so even on a major trauma patient, if we use two grams, we're getting this done administered under $50 cost for us in the field. However, if you're going to use it, check, make sure it's on your state formulary. Go over it with your bank control doc. Make sure they're on board. So now all the wonderful new stuff we do about bleeding control in the pre-hospital environment, what about some of the old good stuff? Well, the original old dog was direct pressure on the wound site. We'll forcefully hold pressure on the wound to slow down the flow of blood. Ideally, as the gauze becomes saturated to a point, it's also exposed to the air and we may begin getting some clots forming, thus slowing down the bleeding. If our dressings become saturated and soaked through, we'll add additional dressings to it. We don't want to go removing any dressings that we've got that are soaked because any clots we've started to build will just get torn away. It's also good to note that this may be initiated by a provider or by the patient initially. So if you respond to a scene where you have multiple patients, you can have them hold direct pressure on their wounds initially. As long as they're conscious and able to follow commands, they may be able to initiate their own bleeding control as you go through your triage. If this doesn't work, however, if we gauze soaks through, we've added more dressings, and now we're still seeing it soak through that, and we need to get more aggressive, the next stage would be now a tourniquet. We'll wrap the tourniquet around the limb. You want to be at least three to four inches above the wound site, and we never want to apply a tourniquet over a joint. Part of the reason for that is we can do damage to nerve structures that run through the joint, but also many of the vessels that we're looking to compress or squeeze down run in through the joint in the interior, and therefore it's harder for our tourniquet to actually get a good squeeze on them. Now once the tourniquet's on and Velcroed in place, we tighten the windlass until such time as the bleeding is controlled. As you can see in the picture here, the windlass has been tightened down, it's hooked in the little plastic clip there, and we're starting to secure the Velcro band over that to make sure the windlass doesn't come loose and doesn't get knocked off. Once the bleeding is controlled, we secure it in place, we'll document the time of application, but even though we've secured a tourniquet in place and done everything right and Velcroed over it once or twice, we still need to consciously recheck it on a regular basis to make sure that the bleeding hasn't started again, that something hasn't gone wrong, that our tourniquet hasn't moved, etc. Now, in an area that can't use a tourniquet, we can use wound packing. Now, wound packing is basically packing gauze or other material directly into the wound, trying to put pressure on the interior. Now, this is going to be extremely painful for the patient because you may be burying your finger or thumb one to two knuckles deep into their wound, trying to stuff in there and put pressure on their bleeding. It's also something that may be difficult for inexperienced rescuers. They may find it a little bit troubling to do this because it's likely that the patient, when you're doing this, will be somewhat vocally protesting your efforts. However, remember, we have to do something to stop their bleeding, and therefore packing the wound to get pressure on the internal bleeding is for the patient's best effort. Now, someone asked me once how much we should put in there. I'll go with this. Our general approach is to stuff as much material as possible into the wound, and then once we think we've got enough, stuff a little bit more. 
Ideally, we're doing it until the bleeding is stopped or significantly slowed down. We have to keep the blood in the patient. Now, in closing, again, controlling bleeding is one of the most fundamental skills for every level provider, from basic first aid with the scouts, all the way on up to physicians who have to control bleeding in ERs. Uncontrolled bleeding has caused countless deaths in trauma patients. Many military-based modalities have made their way into our practice back here on the home front. One of the most notable of these is the tourniquets, as well as the junctional tourniquets and things like that. But what we're doing is we're adapting many of the military's best practices now for pre-hospital trauma back here on the home front. And that's great. Also, hemostatic agents may be useful depending on the nature of your practice. This is something that you need to sit down, discuss with your director, your med control, your training department, and come up with, okay, is this something that we need? Where could we use it? How could we use it? Depending on how far you are from a trauma center or if you're forced to work in a very wilderness or austere setting. If you're three hours from a trauma center and you say, you know, we've got tourniquets for limb injuries, but what do we have for torso injuries or belly wounds? Again, look at your setting, come up with the best choices for you because we know doing the best for the patient involves keeping the blood in them. Hey there, I'd like to thank you all for stopping by, checking out our video. If you want more information about our company or any of the stuff we do, you can check out our website. If you need EMS Continuing Education Hours, we do have our online education platform posted up there. Also, we have our email address if you have any questions. You can find us on YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, and Rumble. We maintain channels on all of those. Also... Please like, share this out to your friends, subscribe, help support the channel, and we'll keep putting more videos out there for you. Oh, well, enough about that. I know what I'm up for. Time for a cup of coffee. Y'all have a great day. Be safe out there. Bye.